Good morning, everyone uh, in Doha and around the world. Um, thank you, Paul, for the kind introduction. Pleasure talking uh, to you. And uh, of course, I'd rather be there with you. And as Paul said, I will be soon, and I'm enormously looking forward to it. And we'll talk about sports cardiology, as Paul said, a topical um, um, talk. Um, I'm aware also for you in, in, in Doha, um, there have been cardiac events recently, and I will not bombard you with numbers through my talk, but will also talk about these. Um, overall, I want to give you an overview of what sports cardiology is and can be, and maybe also shake some images you might have of sports cardiology and make us think um, how we can further improve uh, sports cardiology as a specialty worldwide, but particularly with a very good service you have, also develop it further at Aspita. Um, these are my disclosures, and, and they tell you what, uh, as Paul already said, where I work, how I work, where I've gained my experiences, um, um, and it's important about what I'm talking today. I've had the pleasure of being the lead sports cardiologist ISCH, and together with Matt Wilson, who most of you know, we've, we've pushed the accelerator down over the last 18 months and really built up the sports cardiology department at ICH. However, um, I, it's with great pleasure that I have to change my disclosure a little bit and I will join you uh, and join the sports cardiology team soon um, to come and move to Doha and work with you. Um, I'm also, and this is important for what I want to say regarding COVID, an expert group member and um, one of the chief COVID cardiology advisors to the UK government medical health regulatory agency, the Joint Commission Vaccination Immunization, and also to Public Health England, which is now called the Health Security Agency. Let's go into the matter then. What is sports cardiology? All have your images in your mind, and probably what you're thinking of is this, if you have seen advanced screening in elite clubs, and this is indeed screening, screening of athletes. Um, this is now performed in many elite um, academies um, and elite clubs, and uh, often this is done with a multitude of uh, tools. And you can see here one of the most modern screening setups that goes beyond screening. We talk about it. And this is one end of the spectrum, and screening has also been a topic of research. And you will have seen many, many screening discussions, screening papers, also arguments of what is the best tool. And yes, sports cardiology is about screening, and this is to uh, discover um, cases of sudden cardiac death or risk for it. And the other thing you've seen is obviously this. This is um, tragic events like, um, or uh, near tragic events like this of um, Ericsson. We are all aware of it. And I use these two pictures to illustrate already um, that sports cardiology has developed because if I had given you a screening picture 15 years ago and a cardiac arrest picture 15 years ago, 20 years ago, then you would have seen this. You would have seen some athlete sitting on a, um, in a sweaty sports hall on a, on a makeshift table with some stickers put on his chest and then an ECG being done by healthy uh, volunteers and then being interpreted by cardiologists and often not sports cardiologists with a lack of uh, uh, expertise in this. Or oh, indeed, indeed, tragically, you would have seen the, and you might have seen the cardiac arrest of uh, Mark Vivian Foyer, a Cameroon player at the Confed Cup in 2003. And you can see here after a cardiac arrest, the immediate response from the resus teams, which of course in Ericsson's case was exemplary, but also the situational awareness of the players, which have completely changed. And it was, it was, um, 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 emotional to see, but also somewhat reassuring to see the reaction of the players, uh, of the Denmark players around Ericsson. And this shows you already that we have moved on. And <clears throat> not only the professionals, but also the football and the sports community has moved on in terms of how aware are we of cardiac arrest. And this is very important because this awareness also can cause some problems, as I will say later. However, what I think where sports cardiology is actually, and that's what my talk will be about, is this. Last week I sat um, at Old Trafford at the uh, game against Aston Villa. I know it's at the moment very difficult to choose a game picture of a game that United actually wins, but this was the FA Cup game which United did win. And this is half time, and this is the United um, staff and support uh, team going back to the tunnel. And the question for me was, is cardiology, sports cardiology there? Should it be there? And, and indeed, in this case, was there. And if you look at sports cardiology in this picture of, of a multitude of professional peoples, being it um, the medical team, physios, sports scientists, coaching staff, then of course you can see the red big resource bag. And yes, sports cardiology is there. 
but otherwise sports cardiology is not there. Is it really? And I thought about it and said, actually, it was. And this was in my case. Two weeks before this game, there were two cardiac MRIs. There were multiple ECGs. There were multiple echocardiograms. There were several discussions with team doctors. There were discussions with the coaching team via the team doctor about return to play training for one or two players. And there were also consultations um, with players to um, either make plans or also answer questions. And of course, there were consultations and questions also about vaccination when after a COVID infection, for example, even which vaccinations. So yes, cardiology is at the pitch side as well in this respect, and that's what I think in a modern um, world this should be, but it should then still stay at the background. Here just the facts many of you know and you all know, and I will not go into this, but obviously sudden cardiac death is a phenomenon that is being found in athletes. We usually say one in 50,000 to one in 100,000 of sudden cardiac death per player. This is a relatively rare risk. And you can also see here that black male basketball players are at the highest risk of, we usually say one in 9,000 players to suffer a sudden cardiac arrest. And um, we can discuss why this might be the case. Other sports, um, um, types of sports are less frequented. And of course, here already begs the question, blanket screening or not, should we actually screen some risk groups more than others? But you can also see that with the early advance of the screening program here, if you can see my mouse, the Italian athlete age, uh, the Italian data, reduced the frequency of sudden cardiac death over the 80s and into the 90s and give, has given us proof to use screening. And this is very important, of course. What do we want to do in the end with screening? We, and this is, a, of course, one of the holy grails of the, of the million dollar question of sports cardiology. We want to find out, um, is there any pathology? Up here, you can see a 16 year old and non-athlete down here, the two echocardiograms at the bottom, this is a left ventricle in a long axis and short axis view. You can see a healthy athlete, uh, 16 years old, um, same male, who has, and you might need to take my word for it, a hypertrophic heart, but normally so. And the real million dollar question is, can we differentiate between this athlete up here, which I've just shown you with a slightly thicker heart and a sub 11 16 year old 100 meter runner down here who has and has been proven later a uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that would predispose him to sudden cardiac death and again it is quite difficult and i think we really need to sharpen our tools even more to find out what's going on here and diagnose um, these um, athletes early so to illustrate it in another way is, and this is about, uh, about cardiomyopathies, heart muscle disease that are one of the main culprits for sudden cardiac death um, that we see in athletes. And the conundrum is that we've got this so-called gray zone or subclinical disease. It is easy for everyone to diagnose a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or a right-sided cardiomyopathy if the disease is so progress progressed that we see the disease at this spectrum. But Rarely do we see this in athletes. We see athletes here, which have changes to the heart that might be training, but might also be a beginning um, cardiomyopathy. And um, this, as I say, is, is the difficulty in the whole business or one of these. If you look at more recent data, and this has brought a lot of criticism to us as a screening um, community. This is our FA data that Neil Malotra and, um, ha has published with us at the FA group um, some years ago. And this shows that since the screening program the FA has over the, uh, the 90s, we had some kind of sudden cardiac death. And indeed, the sudden cardiac death were caused by cardiomyopathy. These diseases I just shown you, we can actually pick up by echocardiogram and ECG. Interestingly enough, most of these were not picked up at the time of screening, and these athletes died. And interesting, more interestingly, even if we blindly reviewed this with our new tools in 2017 and 18, still many of them would have, or most of them would not have been picked up. So people say, well, screening does not work. However, you need to look also when they died. Some of them died 10 years after they were screened. So this clearly calls for a screening that needs to be intermittent and longitudinal. But it is quite clear we still have a way to go. Although overall, the screening um, sensitivity of our tests, particularly ECG, and if you put echocardiography on top, is 94%. We mustn't forget it. It was in the 80s, 10 years ago, and this has really improved. 
If you want to discuss and read screening and Nathan writing, who most of you will know, and I've written in the Aspita Journal, uh, uh, a critical discussion, should actually screening be mandatory and do we pick something up? This paper also shows, however, why screening is not being implemented or what the most common reason is for screening not being implemented. And the most common reason is that no facilities, no expertise, least so no equipment, but no pathways are there for follow up. And I think this is one of the most crucial points of the whole world of sports cardiology. Don't do screening if you cannot follow them up. And I would even go further. I think if you want to do cardiac screening, you need to have facilities to do the follow up for the athlete's sake, because it's nothing is worse than screening someone and not acting on it. And furthermore, if an athlete goes to the sports cardiologist, is being screened and gets an anonymous result and is then sent out to some other doctor or the club has to find some doctor to look after this player. This is not good practice and every screening program should have a designated pathway for follow-up of these diseases with not only cardiology expertise, with sports cardiology expertise, who then can bring in other um, um, uh, specialists in the field of cardiology who might be needed. This is how we do it um, at United and is interesting and I'm moving on here um, to another area of sports cardiology which is not screening, which goes beyond screening and we've, uh, Steve McNally, a team doctor at United and I have coined this term cardiac profiling because we must be realistic, that's what we've been doing. We're not only screening these players, they get more um, frequent care and also a deeper care of the heart and we call this cardiac profiling. And why do we do this? Well, Cardiological irregularities in athletes are, are not uncommon. Um, sudden cardiac death is uncommon, but there are many, many cardiac problems. And interesting enough, they're coming out now as we talk more to players, be it palpitations, be it dyspnea, be it sometimes mild arrhythmias. And there are atrial arrhythmias that will not kill you, but they uh, reduce your performance. So a cardiac sports cardiology service needs to, in an elite setting, clearly needs to cater for these as well and not only do a basic screening. As I said, um, um, cardiological contraindication to competitive sport is rare. And while 10 years ago, um, um, it was um, used often to disqualify uh, uh, athletes due to cardiological reason. Now we've got much more stringent criteria and we have liberated this a little bit to the point that some people asked, are we liberating it too fast? I don't think so. But it is important for the athlete to say, seeing a cardiologist and having a finding does not mean my career is over. And we've worked very hard, not only at United, but ISCH also at other football clubs and other sporting associations to build up this trust with the athletes to say exactly this, cardiology will help me and not disqualify me. Yeah? And that's quite important. So what we do is, or how I see we can work in sports cardiology is not only screen, but it's profile. And that means diagnose. It often means treat, and we'll give you, ex give you examples. Recover, and then keep monitoring players. And you might say this is very intensive, and of course, a, a national screening program cannot do it. But I would like to say we have to be bold enough to say we are providing care for an elite population. And this requires more than just screening. and it can be justifiably so. Clinical service, this is just uh, for info at, at United, we uh, do ECGs at, uh, under 12 years old, and it is a similar program to, to Aspita and Aspire, in fact, which is fantastic. Um, and then uh, they've, all the women's and men's first teams have um, profiling every year. And I even have um, um, clinics at the moment once a month at, at, at the training ground at United, which you see on the left, of course, we've got the the um, privilege of having a little hospital with a big card, cardiac um, department, I would call it, at the medical center at Carrington. How can we assess athletes? I uh, want to show you this, what's happening at the moment. Where do I think we can improve? We can do a lot of things. And yes, this is here an athlete and I've thrown a lot of tests at this athlete. So we've done an ECG, you don't see this here, but we also have done an ultrasound test. We will do a cardiopulmonary exercise test. You can see the mass. We also do a stress ECG, and we will even do on these athletes um, a exercise uh, cardiac ultrasound and exercise echocardiogram. And I will go a little bit more into detail in a minute why I think this helps and why I think we should use it in a cardiac assessment, as I say here, that goes beyond screening. So this is fantastic. However, if you ask me, 
single out one or two tests you really need in athletes, then I think we will more and more go into in-field monitoring. And this starts with in-field heart monitoring. And here I, I uh, show you a trace of an athlete that has helped us diagnose an atrial arrhythmia. And it does not meet, need any um, difficult <coughs> pardon me, equipment. The red trace is the heart rate. You're, of course, very familiar more than me with all these um, heart rate monitorings. But what you can see here, and this is a um, um, Paralympic um, cyclist and a time trial. And she told me, I can finish my race. I can even hold my place in the race. My power output stays the sa same, but I feel something is not okay. And you can see this here. And indeed, the power output, there's a start, huge power output, then settles into a racing um, routine and her power output, interesting enough, stays the whole say, stays the same during the whole race. But look at the heart rate here. And that's what she describes from one moment to the other, my heart rate jumps. So here it is maybe 160 and then it goes over 200. This is not a physiological response, no heart rate. And she did not even sprint at the finish line. Um, this was in the middle of the race. No heart rate would jump like this. And this simple trace from a heart rate monitor gave me the <clears throat> diagnosis of an atrial rhythm, which we then confirmed with rhythm monitoring. So mobile rhythm monitoring, because arrhythmias is in the end the uh, most common reason for sudden cardiac death, is extremely important. And this picture shows you also something else. As a sports cardiologist, yes, you sit in, we sit in our offices often, and as I said, but not at the bench, but we need to have communication with the um, coaching staff, science, sports scientists, and with the athletes themselves via the team, medical team. So communication is a key when working with these elite athletes. What else can be done in terms of rhythm monitoring? Well, these are little um, cordless rhythm monitorings, and they are, they are the, the must in elite athletes. I mean, I, uh, to work with, with, with cabled um, ECG monitoring in athletes is, I'm afraid, obsolete. This is last century. We need to have these little monitors which give you not only the heart rate, but give you the heart rhythm. It's very important you get a fantastic what used to be called halter ECG monitoring, just with a little um, little patch here that is sticked on. It's very easy to put on by sports scientists or, or a medical team of the club, can be taken away and gives you accurate results. And what you find are, for example, so-called by Germany, extraventricular beats from the lower chambers. They can happen in athletes, but might be a worrisome, so it needs to be investigated. Or here you've got a some people would argue, but it's almost a run of VT of three beats at a heart rate of roughly 150. So this is not quite normal. And this would need to be followed up because ventricular tachycardia can be a reason for sudden cardiac arrest. Here, I have to say it also depends on what your patient is and the patient's name. In this case, you can see up here. And in this case, I bluntly ignored it. And I've done it so for five years and I'm still well. Maybe I shouldn't. So. What else can we do? What else uh, can we do to, to monitor the athlete? And I'm um, a big fan, if I may say, of exercise echocardiography. Because remember, most of the tests we do, the ECG and the uh, echocardiogram, they, they are done at rest. And this means the heart is idle, particularly in athletes. Heart rate is 45 to 50. We do not see a stressed heart, which we know is more prone to arrhythmias. So, um, monitoring the heart at rest is not what all we want. This is a heart, the same heart now at mild to moderate exercise, and this is a heart at moderate exercise on a reclining bike um, with a heart rate of 150, 160, and some cardiac diseases, that's why sudden cardiac arrest is common in athletes, because some diseases um, produce cardiac problems more during exercise than at rest. And for you as sports scientists, as sports physicians, um, nurses working in sports, it's probably a no-brainer. Of course I want to access, uh, assess the heart at rest because that's when the heart works hardest in athletes. And indeed this cardiac reserve is what we would like to um, find out about has been difficult over the last 10, 15 years because you need the technology, you need the expertise to assess the heart at rest and you need some pathways. And indeed, previously, this so-called stress echocardiography was done, but there was a human factor. If you knew how to do it, if you were an, an, an experienced um, seasoned cardiologist or sonographer, then you could ace it. If you were not, then it was difficult and it gave you wrong results. However, um, Andre Lagerge and as we have and younger athletes have found out that there is a 
um, methodology that is called um, strain imaging, which I show you pictures about, which can give you a absolute um, quantitative measurement of um, cardiac function, and we're using this now. And this looks like this. On the left side, you've got heart at rest, and on the right, doing exercise. And you can see these curves of myocardial function, and these are various areas of the heart. There are different areas, and this are, is depicted here. And it's just very beautiful because it gives you the function. It gives you also the timing. You can see here at exercise, all parts of the heart um, contract synchronously and relax synchronously. So this is very good and reassuring. And we use it in research uh, with my colleagues at Exeter, Professor Williams, and also at Aspire, at FCB, and at United um, in academy athletes and do it for the left side of the heart and for the right side of the heart and combine it with a VO2 to give us a relationship between the metabolic demands at exercise and the heart hydrosound. And for people who are interested why we're we doing it well, for example, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there's some um, um, data out in my ex um, PhD supervisor at Oxford, Professor Hugh Watkins, one of the um, grades of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy does think that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is also a metabolic disease. And that's why you do have the cardiac arrest during exercise, because your heart changes from fatty acid metabolism to anaerobic glycolytic metabolism. And that's when you have the problems if you've got an underlying cardiac disease. And what we've shown is, and we've published this firstly in normal values, and what the Toronto group has shown when I was there as well, that during exercise, you can differentiate between teenagers with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in blue and healthy volunteers. At rest, their myocardial function measured by strain is the same. You cannot differentiate who's got a heart muscle disease and who is normal. But if you exercise their hearts um, on a bike, as I've shown you, you've got this scissoring effect. So you can actually diagnose mild cardiac disease during exercise that you could not diagnose. And of course, um, uh, one of the first groups who ex would explore this in athletes is of course Sanjay's group in London, Sanjay Sharma's group, and they have indeed shown um, less elegantly because they used ejection fraction, not strain, but they have shown that if you exercise uh, healthy athletes, your cardiac function goes up, as you can see here. If you've got patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, this is not the case. Fantastic tool. <clears throat> Next tool we need to have is, of course, um, um, MR imaging, and we are fortunate enough to have this at Old Trafford, so we can um, put this um, the player in the MR straight after we have a suspicion, and we can do this, of course, at ASPIT as well, and this timely investigation is very important. This is still a bit of a toy, but I think it's a fantastic tool, and I've developed this together with others, of course, with uh, Canon. This is called fusion imaging, because remember, I've shown you all these tests, and particularly the imaging tests, are done separately. What I need to do in my head, I need to synchronize the MI picture with the echocardiographic picture, the CT picture with the echocardiographic picture. But this is a paper in brief that shows, for example, that if I see dysfunction, low function on the echocardiogram on the ultrasound. This, these are usually the areas where you've got scarring fibrosis in the heart. And uh, Canon has developed the technique, the fusion imaging, where if you do an ultrasound, you've done a CT in here or an MI before, you can do the ultrasound and the software automatically corrects the CT or MI imaging, images according to your echo image. So you know exactly where you are and you can compare the MI CT image with the ultrasound. This is something to come in. Coming back after all these um, technical investigations is the message that if you work with elite athletes, you need to have, you're bound to have a time sensitive decision making and communication to the athletes. And I think this is absolutely the key. And I think here as cardiologists, we are in some way, I don't want to sound um, too romantic, but we do serve the athlete, but also the medical and the coaching team in this respect, because they need to make these decisions. And I think you can make these decisions. It's, it's often said, well, cardiology needs time, you need to have MDTs and so on. Yes, you have, you need to have these things, but in an elite setting, this can be done fast. And two examples, one is Michael Carrick, and of course I only talk about it because Michael has written it eloquently about it in, in his book. Michael, in his last year playing, had a, had a cardiac problem, he had an arrhythmia, he was diagnosed, um, we got in touch, he was diagnosed by us in, within half a week, he had a procedure done, 
and he was back um, in training three weeks later and he could play again at the end of the season. It was important for Michael because it was his final season and this also shows you why communication is so important and that's why I'm saying it here because Michael was then 33, it was his last season, he had his still uh, games with all his friends planned for the end of the season, he wanted to finish the season on a high um, but he hadn't arisen yet. So we sat together many times and, 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 and said, Michael asked, you know, what's the risk? What's the risk for me? I've got a family, I've got two kids. Um, is there indeed a risk for some kind of arrest or not? And we discussed it and it was quite clear, not immediately, but you have, as you say, there's a heart, um, there's a arrhythmia that might come back. So this player, Michael, decided, let's I finish the season. I want to finish it anyway, and, and, and I will not push for more. If I had sat there with a 19-year-old player, the discussion would have been different. A 19-year-old player who started the career without family, not having made his a stellar career like Michael has, would have said, I take a much higher risk. I want to play. And this is very important. The cardiologist is not there to um, um, define um, the decision. It's a, it's a shared decision-making, as we say. The other ways of communication are the following. You will have heard, and we talk about it in a different sense in a minute, but uh, Victor had a, a chest pain, as you can see. You can see, see Steve McNally there, who was immediately there during the game. And of course, he had all investigations. And this is equally important. <laughs> Victor is fine, as you can see as well, by, because he's played for the last two weeks, so there's no hard problem. But it is very important as well to work together here with the player, with the medical uh, team to do the tests, but also give reassurance and not as a written letter somewhere away the cardiologist thinks is all right. These players, and particularly now with heightened sensations of, of cardiac arrest, it's extremely important that we as cardi cardiologists communicate um, to the players. I feel it's best done with the medical team and directly to the players, how we do it at United. And this is, I think, a fantastic way of care. And I think this needs to be strength strengthened in most institutions that particular um, results such as cardiology are discussed directly with um, the players and everyone from the medical team of the club of the institution who is involved. Quick word um, to talking about um, detraining. This is an athlete's heart. It's thickened, it's hypertrophic, and you are primed now. You will say, well, this might be a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and indeed it might be. And what we've done previously, we just told this athlete to not train for three months, because if it was indeed training-related and nothing else, because we know that training-related changes <coughs> where the heart gets thickened, if we don't let the athlete train for three months, we can easily find out if it's really a cardiomyopathy, which would progress and get worse, or if it is indeed training related. This has no place in modern sports cardiology, because you know this better than anyone else, not having, not letting an athlete train, particularly in during sports for three months, um, throws them back by a year or 18 months in his career pro progression and his training uh, progression. And I don't think we need to do this at all anymore. So detraining for me is out. Of course, if you want to do this, and this is the question, if you want to take out these elite service to the community or do it in clubs, then there's always mobile cardiac um, monitoring. Um, Canon and I have uh, built a, a little um, van with, with all the, basically all the equipment I've shown you in the last 20 minutes is in there. And Matt Wills and I have pushed to bring this on the road and we are screening. This is uh, St. George's of Air Academy. Some of you will recognize it. Um, in the UK and we can go to clubs and do the screening. But of course, this is now going back to the basic screening, also something we can take out into the community because after all, we provide these athletes elite services, but we can take these services and benefit the whole nation with this expertise. So you can take this out, do an ECG, do an ECG in ultrasound. And I think as the World Economic Forum has said, and I've written it up here, healthcare in 2030, it's mainly home spital and not hospital particular for these things. So now um, I'm sure you have, you, you have thought about it with recent events. Um, talk a little bit about um, is there an increase in cardiac arrests due to COVID, of course. Not many people spell it out or even more so due to the vaccination. And you will have seen reports in the newspapers and there has been quite a lot in the UK also that um, um, pundits on TV have called for more investigations into 
um, association between uh, COVID and cardio cardiac arrests, but also between vaccinations. And I have to say that these comments were a little bit premature because there's a lot of things going on and has been going on um, to investigate are there indeed any um, associations. And I've shown you this as well. The press has also often been very indiscriminatory. I mean, Victor, as I say, has got a normal heart, but of course he clutched his chest and then he has a heart attack. Many other um, athletes who've been sure, who've been um, reported in the news as having cardiac arrest due to vaccination or COVID indeed have many other reasons. I've tried to put my head out and, and in the uh, most prominent UK newspaper and try to clarify that a little bit. Of course, it has been um, put into a very sensational report while I, where I have said that at the present it is a um, cluster statistical cluster. We've got no evidence. And when this article came out in November, I was just together with all my other sports cardiology colleagues at the IOC conference. We looked at the American, at the English, at the European data, and there's indeed no um, strong suspicion to suggest that because of COVID, we've got a much higher incidence of cardiac arrests. And this is uh, very important. But um, let's look at some figures. COVID in the heart. You might remember in the beginning, and this was, has also um, shaped our, our attitude at the moment, is that in the beginning reports came out that COVID affects the heart of nearly one fourth or more of patients who do have COVID. And this is of course alarming, but we must remember this was really the first studies coming out with a multimorbid elderly age in patients who had cardiac uh, disease, who had respiratory disease. And indeed, this was the case there. Again, these autopsies were done on, on, on individuals with COVID <clears throat> and 62% of, of uh, viral replication rates in the myocardium has not been confirmed and is not the case in a mild to moderate COVID infection. Then early studies involve cardiac MI, which is a gold standard for myocarditis, which is basically what COVID can cause. And indeed, there were studies showing that, as you can see here, 46 percent on half of the people with COVID had scarring fibrosis of the heart, which is the main risk factor for um, arrhythmias, hence sudden cardiac arrest. Again, these numbers were, these were subpopulations of hospitalized people. The studies weren't really um, well designed. So some good studies have recently come out, and I only mentioned this, there's even newer studies to show that COVID Cardiac involvement, and that means cardiac involvement, that does not mean cardiac arrest. It means cardiac involvement, which might be a, a non-sustained, a very short arrhythmia. It might be troponin rise with some chest pain and no symptoms. is um, to the magnitude of 0.7% in athletes who have COVID. Other studies say um, up to 2%. So um, one in 100 athletes who've got a significant COVID have, uh, has cardiac symptoms, which is relatively comparable to other viral myocarditis. So, however, I am, would be the last one to, to, to um, um, just sideline myocarditis from COVID, because firstly, myocarditis is not due to COVID. Any myocarditis in athletes has a, has a sudden cardiac arrest rate of 7 to 20%, which means um, 7 to 20% of cardiac arrests in the athlete population are due to myocarditis. So it is important and we need to, and we've always done it, we need to really try to diagnose it and it is very rare. There's a multi-pediatric COVID inflammatory syndrome. This is only in children and um, not uh, so much um, important for athletes. Now, so to summarize, COVID myocarditis is there. We need to check for it, but it is not extremely frequent. And the frequency of sudden cardiac arrest, as far as we have the data now, and um, indeed I have the um, opportunity, sometimes the burden, to look at this data every week in the UK um, as I'm one of the cardiology advisors for COVID from the um, um, Public Health England, as it were, and um, we do not see a spike. The uh, more controversial topic is, of course, vaccine-associated myocarditis, and indeed um, I have, uh, I'm quite confident to look at the numbers here unless people don't report. And Yes, clearly there is a signal, as we would say, with mRNA vaccinations and myocarditis. This signal is very rare. You can see for Pfizer and Moderna, it's a bit different. 12 cases of myocarditis for Moderna, and this is data from yesterday, um, or an incidence of 55 cases per million doses of Moderna um, myocarditis. 
So this is fairly rare. The general uh, myocarditis um, incidence is probably 200 per million. This maybe 400 per million. If it's high, it's very difficult to get good data. So it's extremely rare, but it's clearly there is something that needs to be studied. Um, important to say is, um, of course, we cannot cluster all ages together because this means for adults that vaccinating adults and athletes, um, the benefit risk ratio is clearly on the side of the benefits. Um, vaccination associated myocarditis is extremely rare in adults. Um, the other thing is also, um, before I go to the guideline, that this myocarditis, and I'll talk about it in a second, is most often mild. But the message is for athletes, adult athletes, the benefit to have this vaccination is, is, is there. The risk to have a heart-related problem from the uh, vaccination is extremely rare. I would like to be honest as well, though, if you go down to, um, to children, then it is a different matter. If you want to vaccinate uh, 5 to 12-year-olds from the myocarditis point of view, and um, I'm careful what I'm saying here, but I think the data supports what I'm saying. There is no benefit from a cardiac point of view, if you want to give a child a vaccine to prevent myocarditis from COVID, there's no benefit because the risk of inducing myocarditis from the vaccination, extremely, extremely rare, but it is the same because myocarditis from COVID in children is extremely rare as well. And in fact, the, the UK has recognized it and myself and a virologist and eminent immunologist, we have said exactly this and, and also this article was controversial. We did say, um, there is a tiny risk of myocarditis and the benefit to prevent heart disease in children from COVID by giving the vaccine is really not there. We've also brought out, and this is just to show the UK is actually on its toes. We are monitoring all this. Um, there's a guideline which I've chaired um, to what to do if you've got cases of suspected myocarditis. And of course, this is also the problem because these myocarditis cases are not investigated like I've shown you with echocardiogram, exercise, echo rhythm monitoring, MRI. These are usually reports from GPs and from patients themselves. So it, it, we might over under report it. But the message is in adults, the myocarditis risk from the vaccine is very rare. But it is interesting that these COVID vaccines, and it's not virus associated, of course not, is an inflammatory um, response. Um, and I can tell you here the clinical course, it lasts usually two to five days. And the myocarditis we see after the vaccination is, who is at risk? It is indeed, well, it is our athlete population. It's, it's male between 18 and 29 years old. It's, we thought, was more often after the second dose, but it's very important because of the intervals between the doses. If you leave a long interval, then it's much, much less common. Um, it can be, in very rare cases, severe. There have been some death worldwide, very rare, and they were associated to other pathologies. It's a bit um, muddy, this water, but there have not been many deaths and there have not been many arrests. So all these um, athletes who were supposed to have arrested and in the UK, for example, we got no data that this was associated to the vaccine. So it is rare and often it's mild and it recovers and it's usually the first seven days after the vaccine and we we um, um, we recommend that players do rest for at least 24 hours maybe 48 hours and we will put this into the guideline but it usually people recover what i'm worried about is and that's why this is the only reason i'm worried about is two studies in the american uh, in, from america good studies have come out to show and say that in the children who had severe the few children who were um, centralized and then investigated who had um, severe or moderate to severe um, vaccine-related myocarditis, stayed in hospital, had 2.5 days stay in hospital, then recovered all fully. But when they had MI of the small number of children, indeed 90% of those children who were hospitalized with COVID vaccination myocarditis, had scarring and fibrosis in the left ventricle. And this is something we do not see in children. In athletes, 12% of adult athletes do have scarring. Um, we know this, um, even healthy athletes, but children do not have scarring. And this is a, f a finding that I would really very much like to be investigated. And we said this also in our Times article. And I think we need to spend, we cannot um, push this aside. We need more follow-up data, as I said, which we do not have at the moment. And this scarring looks like this. This is fibrosis. And as I say, that's a risk factor for arrhythmias. So 
I'm sure we can discuss it more question, but this is the up to date, up -to -date information on COVID related myocarditis and vaccine related myocarditis. Interesting enough, as last thing I told you, there's a general um, um, there's a uh, general uh, myocarditis associated with um, COVID in children. It's called PIMS, uh, Pediatric uh, Immune Modulated um, Multi-Inflammatory System uh, Syndrome. Here, the vaccine related, so the vaccines do seem to um, um, increase in inflammation because you can see the troponin goes up, whereas in this general COVID malaise in severe cases, this is not the case. And if you do MI imaging, there is late gadolinium enhancement, as I said, um, in many, many cases. So there is a different pathogenetic mechanism which we need to study. These were the rhythms picked up, they were self-sustained, everyone recovered, and I've shown the VMIs. Um, this means also if we assess and when we assess for COVID, I don't think we need to screen everyone who's got a positive test and throw all the tests at these athletes. This creates anxieties in all the protocols, and we've written one as well, which was spearheaded by Matt, have shown a moderately conservative approach. If there are symptoms, we need to investigate, but it needs a judicious approach not to over-investigate because there are false positives, and I've seen some athletes, if picked up early, we've treated them, and they, because uh, I need to say this, if you have a diagnosed myocarditis, the guidelines say three to six months grounding, no training. And this is a very significant decision. So we need to be safe, but we also need to judge this. So I've had two players with mild myocarditis, not United, other Premier League players who have seen and we did rest them in a much shorter uh, interval and they've been fine for months and they play again because it was very, very mild. Yeah? So we need to assess it, which means we need to clinically assess it. Myocarditis is one of the diseases. There's no gold standard test. We need to go back to our clinical acumen together with the tests. And protocols are out and they're basically all the same. So a moderately conservative approach is um, necessary. Last two minutes, I want to talk about one of my pet projects in many senses, and this is the pediatric athlete. And I ask here, are we keeping pace with talent development? This is a statement from the um, um, Olympic um, Medical Committee from a consensus statement that have, of course, realized that we need to look after these athletes because development has happened rapidly. Many of you know, will, uh, or will, will know La Masia, the uh, um, legendary academy at, at FCB. Um, where the likes of Xavi and Yesta and Messi have trained. And of course, you see this every morning. And these pictures are striking, not in terms of footballing success, which I'm so glad that in Doha as well is, is, is clearly visible, but the professionalism, starting with the architecture, is of course completely different. And I think us as sports medicine doctors and cardiologists need to push it a bit and need to really get to the level to give our young athletes uh, um, good care. This is just to say, when and if we screen pediatric athletes, indeed, um, um, Gavin and from Matt's group um, has shown that the adult criteria, the most modern one, they actually do help. The previous criteria are not sensitive at all. They're, you know, false positives are beyond 30%. That's unacceptable. But the new international criteria from 2017, there's a post false positive rate using the adult criteria and pediatrics of less than 10%, and we can use them. However, we found out as well that we, for example, want to diagnose a disease such right-sided cardiomyopathy, which here you see a patient um, with a trabeculated, bad functioning right ventricle. And criteria we have to diagnose is, is the function, but also the diameters of the heart, and you need to take my word for it, but this is a healthy athlete, but the diameters here and here, although they don't look the same, they are the same. So if we use the adult criteria to diagnose this disease in teenagers, it's, it's very insensitive. We've shown that strain, what I've shown you before, this very elegant measurement of myocardial function can help diagnosis, but this paper showed that using other criteria to diagnose cardiomyopathy, a cardiomyopathy that is a risk for sudden cardiac arrest is, is uh, nonsense and is not very sensitive. Our group, and this is also that involving um, um, Aspire, uh, Aspire data, yes indeed, um, we've shown that if you look at 300 athletes, and we use criteria to diagnose two cardiomyopathies. One is a so-called left ventricular non-compaction cardiomyopathy. This is when the left ventricular muscle gets a bit like this, trabeculated. You can see it here. It gets firstly too big, but also has a lot of these crests there here. And you can see this here. This is a disease that pre uh, um, um, presents also with sudden cardiac arrest. 
if we use the adult criteria in athletes who later been shown by us are healthy, then 7% of these athletes would be diagnosed with this disease, which means they couldn't become athletes. And if you look at the right-sided cardiomyopathy, this arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, which I've shown you, if we use the adult criteria, then 15% of pediatric and teenage athletes would be classified as having a disease. Well, this cannot be right. And why is that like this? It is like this because we do not have any pediatric criteria. We only have the adult criteria. And of course, they don't work in children because they're smaller. The heart also works differently. There are different responses to um, training. So here we really need to do a little bit more. We've uh, published an initial paper and the big data with Asp Aspire data and FT Barcelona data will come out uh, very soon. And Nathan Riding, at the last slide, who you know, have, has looked actually into the guidelines documents um, for athletes and tried to find out what is the level of guidance on pediatric athletes. And it's all very poor. If you look at all these studies, also they're very good studies, but they only deal with adults. But the problem is this data is now being used to look at pediatric athletes. And you can see highly relevant are only 23% of these guidance papers. However, 100% of these guidance papers are used to screen pediatric athletes. Um, I don't think this is good enough. And here we do have a lot to do to advance there. This is all I would like to say. Um, at the last um, slide, however, the message, and we use it in UK a lot, that's all great. We're doing elite sports cardiology because there's no doubt what I've shown you, most of it is for elite athletes. But we've shown a way in the UK how we can translate this research, these findings, um, into the health of the nation. For example, the exercise echocardiograms, the, the, the method to use um, cardiac ultrasound during exercise is being used now in Bristol, but also in other centers around the world, um, Boston, uh, Toronto, um, in patients and children with congenital heart disease and helps in planning their surgery and planning their recovery. And I think that's why investing into athlete sports cardiology um, is, is an approach that is worthwhile also for the rest of the healthcare system to improve um, cardiovascular care. Thank you very much.